A man named Albert Osman, picture taken 1957, talking about an event that occurred to him 33 years earlier in 1924 when he was a young man, a timber cruiser in the woods of southern British Columbia. He's taking some time off. He's out looking for gold mines, lost gold mines. He's sleeping in his sleeping bag one night, and suddenly Big Hand picks him up, shoves him to the bottom of the bag, slings him over its back like Santa's bag of toys, and scoops up his camp stores with the other hand and walks off with him. He is captured by a Bigfoot. A man named Albert Osmond in 1957 told about an event that occurred 33 years earlier in 1924 when he was a young man prospecting in the woods of southern British Columbia looking for gold mines. This is his story. I've always followed logging and construction work. This time I had worked over one year on a construction job and thought a good vacation was in order. BC is famous for its lost gold mines. One is supposed to be at the head of the Toba Inlet. Why not look there this time or, and have a vacation at the same time? I took the Union steamship boat to Lund, B.C. From there, I hired an old Indian to take me to the head of the Toba Inlet. This old Indian, he was a very talkative old gentleman. He told me stories about, a, about gold brought up by a white man from the lost mine. This white man was a very heavy drinker, spent his money freely in saloons, but he had no trouble in getting more money. He'd be away a few days, then come back with a bag of gold. But one time, he went to his mine and never came back. Some people said a Sasquatch had killed him. Now at that time, I had never heard of a Sasquatch. So I asked what kind of animal he called a Sasquatch. The Indian said they had hair all over their bodies, but they're not animals. They are people, big people living in the mountains. My uncle saw the tracks of one that were two feet long. One old Indian saw one over eight feet tall. Well, I, I told the Indian I didn't believe in their old fables about mountain giants. It might have been some thousands of years ago, but not nowadays. The Indian said, there may not be many, but they still exist. Well, we arrived at the head of the inlet about 4 p.m. I made camp at the mouth of a creek. The Indian had supper with me and told, I told him to look out for me in about three weeks. I would be camping at the same spot when I came back. Next morning, I took my rifle with me, but left my equipment at the camp. I decided to look around for some deer trail to lead me up into the mountains. On the way up the inlet, I had seen a pass in the mountain that I wanted to go through to see what was on the other side. Now, I spent most of the forenoon looking for a trail, but found none, except for a hogback running down to the beach. So I swamped out a trail from there, got back in my camp about 3 p.m. that afternoon, and made up my pack to be ready in the morning. My equipment consisted of one 30-30 Winchester rifle, I had a special homemade prospecting pick, axe on one end, pick on the other. I had a leather case for the pick, which fastened to my belt, also my sheath knife. The storekeeper at Lund was cooperative. He gave me some cans for my sugar, salt, and matches to keep them dry. My grub consisted mostly of canned stuff, except for a side of bacon, a bag of beans, four pounds of prunes, and six packets of mac macaroni cheese three pounds of pancake flour, and six, six pancakes of Rye King hardtack, three rolls of snuff, one quart sealer of butter, and two one-pound cans of milk. I had two boxes of shells for my rifle. The storekeeper gave me a biscuit tin. I put a few things in there and cashed it under a windfall so I would have it when I came back here waiting for a boat to bring me out. My sleeping bag I rolled up and tied on the top of my pack exact together with my ground sheet, small frying pan, and one aluminum pot that held about a gallon. As my canned food was used, I would get plenty of empty cans to cook with. So the following morning I had an early breakfast, made up my pack, and started out this hog back. My pack had been at least 80 pounds besides my rifle. After one hour I had to rest. 
I kept resting and climbing all that morning. About 2 p.m. I came to a flat place below a rock bluff. There was a bunch of willow in one place. I made a wooden spade and started digging for water. About a foot down I got seepings of water so I decided to camp here for the night and scout around for the best way to get on from here. It must have been up to near a thousand feet. There was the most beautiful view of the islands in the strait. Tugboats with long booms and fishing boats going in all directions. I loved the spot. I spent the following day prospecting around but no sign of minerals. I found a deer trail leading towards this pass that I had seen on my way up the inlet. And the following morning I started out early while it was cool. It was steep climbing with my heavy pack. After three hours climb I was tired and stopped to rest. On the other side of a ravine from where I was resting was a yellow spot below some small trees. I moved over there and started digging for water. I found a small spring and made a small trough from cedar bark and got a small amount of water. Had my lunch and rested here till evening. I made it over the pass late that night. Now I had downhill and good going, but I was hungry and tired. So I camped at the first bunch of trees I came to. I was trying to size up the train what direction I would take from here. Towards west would lead to low land and some other inlet, so I decided to go in a northeast direction. Had good going and slight downhill all day. I must have made 10 miles when I came to a small spring and a big black hemlock tree. This was a lovely camp spot. I spent two days here just resting and prospecting. The first night here I shot a small deer. Two days later I found an exceptionally good campsite. It was two good sized cypress trees growing close together near a rock wall with a nice spring just below these trees. I intended to make this my permanent camp. I cut lots of brush for my bed between these trees. I rigged up a pole from this rock wall to hang my pack sack on and I arranged some flat rocks for my fireplace for cooking. I had a really classy setup. And that is when things began to happen. Now I'm a heavy sleeper. Not much disturbs me after I go to sleep. Especially on a good bed like I had now. Next morning I noticed things had been disrupted during the night. But nothing missing I could see. I roasted my grouse on a stick for breakfast. That night I filled up the magazine of my rifle. I still had a one box of 20 shells and six shells in my coat pocket. That night I laid my rifle under the edge of my sleeping bag. I thought a porcupine had vid visited me the night before and porkies like leather. So I put my shoes in the bottom of my sleeping bag. Next morning my pack sack had been emptied out. Someone had turned the sack upside down. It was still hanging on the pole from the shoulder straps as I had hung it up. Then I noticed one half pound package of prunes was missing. Also my pancake flour was missing, but my salt bag was not touched. Porkies always look for salt, so I, didn't, I decided it must have been something else than porkies. I looked for tracks but found none. I did not think it was a bear. They're always tearing up and making a mess of things. I kept close to the camp these days in case this visitor would come back. I climbed up on a big rock where I had a good view of the camp, but nothing showed up. I was hoping it would be a porky so I would get a good porky stew. These visits had now been going on for three nights. This night it was cloudy and I looked like it might rain. I took special notice of how everything was arranged. I closed my pack sack. I did not undress. I only took off my shoes, put them in the bottom of my sleeping bag. I drove my prospecting pick into one of the cypress trees so I could reach it from my bed. I also put the rifle alongside me, inside my sleeping bag. I fully intended to stay awake all night to find out who my visitor was, but I must have fallen asleep. I was awakened by something picking me up. I was half asleep and at first I did not remember where I was. As I began to get my wits together I remembered I was on this prospecting trip and in my sleeping bag. My first thought was it must be a snow slide but there was no snow around my camp. Then it felt like I was tossed on horseback but I 
could feel whoever it was was walking. I tried to reason out what kind of animal this could be. I tried to get at my, my sheath knife and cut my way out, but I was in almost a sitting position and the knife was under me. I could not get a hold of it. And the rifle was in front of me, I had a good hold of that. And I had no intention to let it go, let go of it. At times I could feel my pack sack touching me, and I could feel the cans in the sack touching my back. After what seemed like an hour, I could feel we were going up a steep hill. I could feel myself rise for every step. What was carrying me was breathing hard and sometimes gave a slight cough. Now I knew this must be one of the mountain Sasquatch giants the Indian had told me about. I was in a very uncomfortable position, unable to move. I was sitting on my feet and one of the boots in the bottom of my bag was crossways with the hobnail sole up across my foot. It hurt me terribly, but I could not move. It was very hot inside. It was lucky for me this fellow's hand was not big enough to close upon the whole bag when he picked me up. There was a small opening at the top, otherwise I would have choked to death. Now, he was going downhill. I could feel myself touching the ground at times, and at one time he dragged me behind him, and I could feel he was below me. Then he seemed to get on level ground and was going at a trot for a long time. By this time, I had cramps in my legs. The pain was terrible. I was wishing he would get to his destination soon. I could not stand this type of transportation much longer. Now, he was going uphill again. It did not hurt me so bad. I tried to estimate distance and directions. As near as I could guess, we were about three hours traveling. And I had no idea when he started at. I was asleep when he picked me up. Finally, he stopped and let me down. Then he dropped my pack sack. I could hear the cans rattle. Then I heard chatter. Some kind of talk I did not understand. The ground was sloping, so when he let go of my sleeping bag, I rolled downhill. I got my head out and got some air. I tried to straighten my leg and crawl up, but my legs were numb. It was still dark. I could not see what my captors looked like. I tried to massage my legs to get some life in them and get my shoes on. I could hear now it was at least four of them. They were standing around me and continuously chattering. I had never heard of a Sasquatch before the Indian told me about them, but I knew I was right among them. But how to get away from them? That was another question. I got to see the outline of them now, and it began to get lighter. Through the sky it was cloudy, and it looked like rain. In fact, there was a slight sprinkle. I now had circulation in my legs, but my left foot was very sore on top where it had been resting on my hobnail boot. I got my boots out from the sleeping bag and tried to stand up. I found that I was wobbly on my feet, but I had a good hold of my rifle. I asked, what you fellas want with me? Only some more chatter. It was getting lighter now and I could see them quite clearly. I could make out forms of four people, two big and two little ones. They were all covered with hair and no clothes on at all. I could now make out mountains all around me. I looked at my watch. It was 4.25 a.m. Uh, it was getting lighter now and I could see the people clearly. They looked like a family. Old man, old lady, and two young ones. A boy and a girl. The boy and the girl seemed to be scared of me. The old lady did not seem to be too pleased about what the old man dragged home. But the old man was waving his arms and telling them all what and what he had in mind. They all left me then. I had my compass and my prospecting glass on my string around my neck. The compass in my left hand shirt pocket and my glass in my right hand pocket. I tried to reason our location and where I was. I could see now that I was in a small valley or a basin about 8 or 10 acres surrounded by high mountains on the southeast side. There was a V-shaped opening about 8 feet wide at the bottom and about 20 feet high at the highest point. That must be the way I came in. But how was I getting out? The old man was sitting near this opening. I moved my belongings up close to the west wall. There were two small cypress trees there, and this was due for a shelter for the time being until I find out what these people want with me and 
how to get away from here. I emptied out my pack sack to see what I had left in the line of food. All my canned meat and vegetables were intact, and I had one can of coffee, also three small cans of milk, two packages of Rag King hardtack, and my butter sealer, half full of butter. But my prunes and my macaroni were missing. Also, my full box of shells for my rifle. I had my sheath knife, my prospecting pick was missing, and my can of matches. I had only had my safety box full, and then held about a dozen matches. That did not worry me. I can always start a fire with my prospecting glass when the sun is shining. If I got dry wood. I wanted hot coffee, but I had no wood. Also, nothing around here that looked like wood. I had a good look over the valley from where I was, but the boy and the girl were always watching me from behind some juniper bush. I decided there must be some water around here. The ground was leaning towards the opening in the wall. There must be water at the upper end of this valley. There is green grass and moss along the bottom. All my utensils were left behind. I opened my coffee tin and emptied the tin well, I emptied the coffee into a dish towel and tied it with the metal strip from the can. I took my rifle in the can and went looking for water. Right at the head under a cliff there was a lovely spring that disappeared underground. I got a drink and a full can of water. When I got back, the young boy was looking over my belongings, but did not touch anything. On my way back, I noticed where these people were sleeping. On the east side wall of this valley was a shelf in the mountainside with overhanging rock, looking something like a big undercut, a big tree about 10 feet deep and 30 feet wide. The floor was covered with lots of dry moss, and they had some kind of blankets woven out of narrow strips of cedar bark, packed with dry moss. They looked very practical and warm, with no need of washing. The first day, not much happened. I had to eat my food cold. The young fellow was coming near me, and seemed curious about me. My one snuff box was empty, so I relied, relied, to, relied it toward him. When he saw it coming, he sprang up quick as a cat and grabbed it. He went over to his sister and showed her. They found out how to open and close it. They spent a long time playing with it. Then he trotted over to the old man and showed him. They had a long chatter. Next morning, I made up my mind to leave this place. If I had to shoot my way out, I could not stay much longer. I had only enough grub to last me till I got back to Toba Inlet. I did not know the direction, but I would go downhill and I would come out near civilization someplace. I rolled up my sleeping bag, put that inside my pack, pack sack, packed the few cans I had, swung the sack on my back, injected the shell into the barrel of my rifle, and started for the opening in the wall. The old man got up, held up his hands as though he would push me back. I pointed to the opening and wanted to go out, but he stood there pushing towards me. And I said something that sounded like, Soka, Soka. I backed up to about 60 feet. I did not want to be too close. I thought, if I had to shoot my way out, a 30-30 might not have much effect on this fella. It might make him mad. I only had six shells, so I decided to wait. There must be a better way than killing them. In order to get out of get out from here, I went back to my campsite to figure out some other way to get out. I could make friends with the young fellow or the girl. They might help me. If I only could talk to them. Then I thought of a fellow who saved me saved himself from a mad bull by blinding him with snuff in the eyes. But how will I get near enough to this fella to put snuff in his eyes? So I decided next time I give this young fellow my snuff box to leave a few grains of snuff in it, he might give the old man a taste of it. But the question is, in what direction will I go if I should get out? I must have been near 25 miles northeast of Toba Inlet when I was kidnapped. This fellow must have traveled at least 25 in the three hours he carried me. If he went west, we'd be near saltwater. Same thing if he went south, therefore, he must have gone northeast. If I, if I then keep going south and over two mountains, I must hit salt water someplace between Lund and Vancouver. The 
following day, I did not see the old lady till about 4 p.m. She came home with her arms full of grass and twigs and all kinds of spruce and hemlock, as well as some kinds of nuts that grow in the ground. I've seen lots of them on Vancouver Island. The young fellow went up mountain to the east every day. He could climb better than a mountain goat. He picked some kind of grass with long, sweet roots. He gave me some one day, then tasted very sweet. I gave him another snuff box with about a teaspoon of snuff in it. He tasted it, then went to the old man. He licked it with his tongue. They had a long chat. I made a dipper from a milk can. I made many dippers. You can use them for pots, too. You cut two slits near the top of any can, then cut a limb from any small tree. Cut down the back of the limb, down the stem of the tree, then taper the pot you cut from the stem. Then cut a hole in the tapered pot, slide the tapered pot in, this, in the slit you have made in the can, and you have a good handle on your can. I threw it over to the young fella that was playing near my camp. He picked it up and looked at it, then he went to the old man and showed it to him. They had a long chatter. Then he came back to me, pointed at the dipper, then at his sister. I could see that he wanted one for her too. I had other peas and carrots, so I made one for his sister. He was standing only eight feet away from me. When I had made the dipper, I dipped it in the water and drank from it. He was very pleased, almost smiled at me. Then I took a chew of snuff, smacked my lips, said, Mmm, that's good. The young fellow pointed to the old man and said something that sounded like ook. I got the idea that the old man liked snuff and the young fellow wanted a box for the old man. I shook my head. I motioned with my hands for the old man to come to me. I did not think the young fellow understood what I meant. He went to his sister and gave her the dipper I made for her. They did not come near me again that day. I had now been here six days, but I was sure I was making progress. If only I could get the old man to come over to me, get him to eat a full box of snuff, that would kill him for sure. And that, and that way kill himself, I would be guilty of murder. The old lady was a meek old thing. The young fellow was by this time quite friendly. The girl would not hurt anybody. Her chest was flat like a boy's, no development like young ladies. I'm sure if I get the old man out of the way, I could easily have brought the girl out with me to civilization. But what good would that have been? I'd have to keep her in a cage for public display? I don't think we have any right to force our way of life on other people, and I don't think they would like it. The noise and the racket in a modern city, they, they'd not like any more than I do. The young fella might have been between 11 and 18 years old and about 7 feet tall and might have weighed about 300 pounds. His chest would be 50 to 55 inches. His waist about 36 to 38 inches. He had wide jaws, narrow forehead that slanted upwards round at the back about 4 or 5 inches higher than the forehead. The hair on their heads was about 6 inches long the hair on the rest of their body was short and thick in places. The woman's hair on the forehead had an upward turn like some women's have. They call it bangs among women's hairdos nowadays. The old lady could have been anything between 40 and 70 years old. She was over 7 feet tall. She would be about five to 600 pounds. She had very wide hips and a goose-like walk. She was not built for beauty or speed. Some of those lovable braziers and uplifts would have been a great improvement on her looks and her figure. The man's eye teeth were longer than the rest of the teeth, but not too long to be called tusks. The old man must have been near eight feet tall, big barrel chest and big hump on his back, powerful shoulders. His biceps on his upper arms were enormous and tapered down to his elbows. His forearms were longer than common people have, but well proportioned. His hands were wide, the palm long and broad and hollow like a scoop. His fingers were short in proportion to the rest of his hand. His fingernails were like chisels. 
The only place they had no hair was inside the hands and the soles of their feet, and upper part of the nose and eyelids. I never did see their ears. They were covered with hair hanging over them. If the old man were to wear a collar, it would have to be at least 30 inches. I had no idea what size shoes they would wear or would need. I was watching the young fellow's foot one day when he was sitting down. The soles of his feet seemed to be padded like a dog's. And the big toe was longer than the rest, very strong. In mountain climbing, all he needed was footing for his big toe. They were very agile. To sit, they turned their knees out and came straight up. To rise, they came straight up without help of hands or arms. I don't think this valley was their permanent home. I think they moved from place to place as food is available in different localities. They might eat meat, but I never saw them eat meat or do any cooking. I think it was probably a stopover place and the plants with sweet roots on the mountainside might have been in season this time of year. They seem to be most interested in them. The roots have a very sweet and satisfying taste. They always seemed to do everything for a reason, wasted no time on anything they did not need. When they were not looking for food, the old man and the old lady were resting. But the boy and the girl were always climbing something or some other exercise. A favorite position was to take hold of his feet with his hands and balance on his rump. Then bounce forward. The idea seemed to be how far he could go without his feet or hands touching the ground. Sometimes he made 20 feet. But what do they want with me? They must understand I cannot stay here indefinitely. I will soon have to make a break for freedom. Now that I was mistreated, not that I was mistreated in any way, one consolation was that the old man was coming closer each day and was very interested in my snuff. Watching me when I took a pinch of snuff, he seemed to think it useless to only put it inside my lips. One morning, after I had my breakfast, both the old man and the boy came out and sat down only ten feet away from me. This morning, I made coffee. I had saved up all dry branches I found, and I had some dry moss and used all the labels from my cans to start a fire. I got my coffee pot boiling, and it was strong coffee too, and the aroma from boiling coffee was what brought them over. I was sitting eating hardtack with plenty of butter on it and sipping coffee. And it sure tasted good. I was smacking my lips, pretending it was better than it really was. I set the can down. I was about half full, intending to warm it up later. I pulled out a full box of snuff, took a big chew. Before I had time to close the box, the old man reached for it. I was afraid he would waste it and only had two more boxes. So I held on to the box, intending him to take a pinch lack and had just done. Instead, he grabbed the box and emptied, in his emptied it in his entire mouth, swallowed it in one gulp. Then he licked the box inside with his tongue. After a few minutes, his eyes began to roll over in his head. He was looking straight up. I could see he was sick. Then he grabbed my coffee can that was quite cold by this time. He emptied that in his mouth. Grounds and all. That did not... That did no good. He stuck his head between his legs and rolled forward a few times away from me. Then he began to squeal like a stuffed pig. I grabbed my rifle. I said to myself, this is it. If he comes for me, I will shoot him, plumb between his eyes. But he started for the spring. He, he wanted water. I packed my sleeping bag in my pack, sack with the few things I had left. The young fella ran over to his mother then she began to squeal. I started for the opening in the wall, and I just made it. The old lady was right behind me. I fired one shot at the rock over her head. I guess she had never seen a rifle fire before. She turned and ran inside the wall. I injected another shell into the barrel of my rifle and started downhill, looking back over my shoulder every so often to see if they were coming. I was in a canyon and good traveling, and I made fast time. Must have made three miles in some world record. I came to turn in the canyon and had the sun on my left. That meant I was going south, and the canyon turned west. I decided to climb the ridge ahead of me. I knew that I must have been two mountain ridges between me and salt water, and by climbing this ridge, I would have a good view of this canyon. 
so I could see if the Sasquatch were coming after me. I had a light pack and was making good time up the hill. I stopped soon after to look back where I had come from, but nobody followed me. When I came over the ridge, I could see Mount Baker. Then I knew I was going in the right direction. I was hungry, and I tried. I opened my pack sack to see what I had to eat. I decided to rest here for a while. I had a good view of the mountainside, and if that old man was coming, I had the advantage because I was above him. To get me, he would have to come up a steep hill, and that might be not so easy after stopping a few 30, <coughs> stopping a few 30, 30 bullets. I had made up my mind this was my last chance, and this would be a fight to the finish. I rested here for two hours. It was 3 p.m. when I started down the mountainside. It was nice going, not too steep, not too much underbrush. When I got near the bottom, I shot a big blue grouse. She was sitting on a windfall, looking right at me, only a hundred feet away. I shot her neck right off. I made it down the creek at the bottom of the canyon. I felt it was safe now. I made a fire between two big boulders, roasted the grouse. Next morning when I woke up, I was feeling terrible. My legs were sore from dirty socks. My legs were sore. My stomach was upset from that grouse that I ate the night before. I was not too sure I was going to make it up the mountain. I finally made the top, but it took me six hours to get there. It was cloudy visibility about a mile. I knew I had to go downhill. After about two hours, I got down to the heavy timber and sat down to rest. I could hear a motor running hard at times, then stop. I listened to this for a while and decided the sound was from a gas donkey. Someone was logging in the neighborhood. I told them I was prospector and I was lost. I did, not tell, I did not like to tell them I had been kidnapped by a Sasquatch as if I had told them they would have probably have said he is crazy too. The following day I went down from this camp on the Samanon branch of Shekhet Linlet. From there I got the Union boat back to Vancouver and that was my last prospecting trip and my only experience with what is known as Sasquatches. I know that in 1924 there were four Sasquatches living. It might only, there might only be two now. The old man, the old lady might be dead by this time. There's no doubt that this is a bona fide film for a number of reasons we're going to go over. All right. First of all, it was a bright sunny day as you can see. What happened was the sun was shining such that it was glinting off of her shoulder and thigh as she walked and you could see her muscles rippling in her shoulder, in her thigh as she walks. In good slow-mo close-up you can see that which they did not provide in that, uh, in that program. All right, if that's a person in a suit, the suit has to be glued to naked skin. In the gluing process, you lose that flexibility, that ripple. The only thing that looks like this does in this film is real skin under, I mean real skin over real muscle working. So we could stop right here, it's real just based on that. Right there, but we don't have to stop. The arm, if you've all seen her walk, she walks along like this. She drags her arm down around her knees where everybody says, she, you know, the hominoids do. Why? The elbow articulates right here, which is much longer from shoulder to elbow than a human. If that's a human in a suit, impossible. You can't get an elbow bend at the same point. So we could stop right there. Solid proof that that's not a human being in a suit. But furthermore, Jerry Romney, the guy they said was in the suit, they stuck him with breasts. What would they do that for? Why go to the problem? Why go to the trouble? As she walks along and she turns back to face him, you see the breasts sway and she takes a couple of steps and you see that nice jiggle that we all know. <laughs> if it's a person in a suit in 1967, it's going to be those early silicone jobs. Remember those? <laughs> Absolutely real right there. Furthermore, she left tracks in the hard-packed sand of the creek bed. One inch deep, we have pictures, we have casts. That cast you saw earlier of the cast in the foot, that was her foot. 
No question, inch deep, walked a 200-pound man beside her not long after. He sank about a quarter of an inch. So we know that as she stood there doing this, she weighed 600 to 800 pounds. Fake that. That's got to be a real lead line suit. 600 to 800 pounds as she walks. So we know that it was a legitimate film. Furthermore, as they pointed out in the program, with the fake films, they can never tell you where it happened and who did it, who took it, because they don't want that guy to be grilled and they don't want experts to go and measure one limb here and know how long, how tall it really was. Well, what Patterson did was he went right out fast as he could and begged every expert in the area that he could call, every anthropologist and zoo person, come out, bona fide sighting, please bring dogs. And you don't want to bring dogs because these things have a very powerful body odor that even, even tracking dogs will recoil from. If it's a person in a suit, it's like the suit's not even there. The dogs are after it. Patterson did, of course, no expert came. Needless to say, they never do. You can't get them to go because they know what will happen. A young man named Grover Krantz went out early in his career as an anthropologist, took a look at one, and he said, it looks real to me. And it's 30-some-odd years later, and I think he's still trying for tenure. <laughs> They've made a tremendous example out of Grover Krantz for what happens to people who side with the enemy in this issue, which is a very volatile, very sensitive issue. Okay, So no experts would come, needless to say. Patterson did everything right that he could except film something that could be real. Other than that, he was great. 